Amen. Uh, if you will, open with me uh, your, open with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. If I had to title this message this morning, I would call it, What Kind of Knife Do You Have? What Kind of Knife Do You Have? Amen. Uh, as you're turning there, I want to open up with a little story. It's called Five Pounds in the Book. A wealthy old gentleman residing in London on one of his birthdays invited his servants into his house to receive presents. Which will you have, he asked, addressing the groom, this Bible or a five-pound note? I will, ta um, I will take the Bible, sir, but I cannot read, so I think the money will do me more good, replied the hostler. And you, he asked the gardener. My poor wife is so ill that I sadly need the money, responded the gardener with a bow, with a bow. Um, Mary, you can read, said the old man, turning to his cook. Will you have the Bible? I can read, sir, but I never get time to look into a book, and the money will buy a fine dress. Next was the chambermaid, but she had one Bible and did not want another. Last came the errand boy. My lad, said the kind benefactor, will you take these five pounds and replace your shabby clothes by a new suit? Thank you, sir, but my dear mother used to read to me that the law of the Lord was better than thousands of gold and silver. I will have the good book, if you please. God bless you, my boy, and may your wise choice prove riches and honor and long life unto you. As the lad received the Bible, and unclasped his covers. A bright gold piece rolled to the floor. Quickly turning its pages, he found them thickly in, inter, interleaved with banknotes. While the four servants discovered their mistake of their worldly covetousness, hath departed in chargon. In chargon. Amen. His, the moral of the story was he made the wrong choice. Amen. We need to pick the right choice. Amen. A lot of times we pick... Worldly things instead of, world, uh, instead of the word. Amen. If you will stand with me, Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 10 and go through verse 18. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of, dark, of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you. We thank you for all that you've done, Father, so much. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your presence that I felt here in this place. I thank you, Father God, for the, for the peace and the love, Father God, and the just... Uh, uh, and willing to just be in your presence, Father. I thank you for the power that you have. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross for our sins. And I pray that you lead and guide me this morning, Father God, with the word that you would have for me to speak. Let it be what you would have it to be, Father. Let it come out of my mouth the way that you want it. Let them hear, uh, hear it the way that you want and what you want, Father. And let them instill it into their lives. Let them apply it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. What makes a sermon effective? Anybody know? What makes a sermon effective? I could stand up here sermon after sermon after sermon and preach after and preach and preach and preach. I could preach an hour. I could preach 10 minutes. But what makes it effective? The anointing and the change comes by applying it to your life. Amen. The change comes by applying it to your life. We've been in a sermon series. We continued it last week. 
and we started it about three or four, three weeks ago. I had to take a couple weeks off, but we're talking about speaking the inspired word of God, speaking unto us and us speaking it unto man. And I don't want to, uh, I don't want to run it into the ground, but it seems like that's where that's where we're at this morning. How many of you actually prayed for somebody when you or spoke life into them? Uh, raise your hand if you spoke life unto somebody. I mean, see, we have the power of life and death is in the tongue. When we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit down inside of us, amen, and we speak unto somebody under the inspired word, the word that God gives us for somebody, we can change their life, we can bring that life uh, uh, that God wants to put into their life, we can bring it into their life, amen, and uh, Ephesians 6, 17, it says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen? Uh, we titled this message this morning, uh, you know, what kind of knife do you have? The Word is like a knife. It's like a sword of a Spirit. It cuts. Amen? It does things. Amen? Uh, first of all, before we can even talk about, amen, uh, what the sword of the Spirit can do or what kind, of, uh, what kind of level of the sword of the Spirit that we have in our life, I believe that we can have different levels even of our knowingness of the Word. Amen? We, can, we go through life a lot of times and, uh, you know, we, we just barely read our word, one of the hardest things for Christians to do is to consistently read their word, amen? The devil wants to, uh, he'll bring distractions up, he'll bring things that will will come up uh, against us, he will bring bring, uh, things that will throw us off course, he'll bring tiredness to us yesterday, amen? How many of you went to uh, to the little kids trip that we had yesterday? Wasn't it awesome? We had a great time, you're pastor wiped out on a water slide. I wiped out. I come out of that thing. We were skiing on our behinds coming across that uh, water slide. I stuck my foot down two or three times and like went over like that and wiped out. But, but you know, we, we had a good time. But when we left there, uh, amen, some of us look more sunburned today than we did when we left, amen. Uh, but, you know, my body, this I fell asleep on the way home. If you if you know me very well, um, Charity drives most of the time when we're around uh, each other, and it took me all of about 15 minutes, if that, to fall asleep after we left the water park. Well, water park, it may have been longer uh, than that, but I remember waking up and my hands not being numb because I was so tired. You ever been so tired when you wake up in the middle of the night that it hurts to even move? See, the devil will try to bring tiredness and weariness uh, upon your body, and what's the one thing that you definitely do not want to do? <laughs> I got to read my Bible. I want to go to bed. <laughs> Amen. It's one of the hardest things, but we got to understand, amen, this is the most reliable word, amen, that the Lord can speak to us. We're in this sermon series about the inspired word of God, amen, God inspiring us and us speaking it unto men, but the most reliable form of that word is right here in the Bible. The Lord's been showing me here lately, we need to become a lover of the word, the written word. We need to love it. We need to love it. How many of you love it this morning? Amen. Amen. It says, and take the helmet of salvation. Amen. This helmet of salvation. Uh, the Lord's already shown me. I'm going to, I, I keep coming back to this armor. Amen. I keep coming back uh, to, the, to the armor. I preach sermons after sermons and I keep coming back to it. But the Lord keeps bringing me back. Amen. The very first scriptures and what I read, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Amen. Be strong. What's that tell me? We need these things if we want to be mighty and powerful in God. Amen. What well, may be some of the reasons why there's so many wishy-washy. Christians and people think there's so many hypocrites in church is because they're not putting on the whole armor of God. Amen. We think we can do it on ourselves. We think that we can walk it without Jesus. We think that we can make decisions. Now listen, we got to keep everything in balance. I've said before, I don't believe I have to say the blessing over this little mint that I eat before, uh, before I eat a, a breath mint or something like that. But if I decide to, is it really going to hurt? Amen? We need to have a lifestyle of loving the Word, amen, and listening to the Word and letting God speak to us, a lifestyle. Now, does that mean we have to constantly, 100% of the time, be reading? No, it don't mean that. 
That's impossible for those of us who work and we got families. We got to give. We got to give things to our families. You know, Paul said one time, I, "I I wish that you guys would stay as I am." He was a single man. You know why that was? Because when you're married and you got kids, you got to give time to that. Amen. And God understands that. But that's why Paul said, "I I I wish that you were as I were." Or however, it was that he worded that because he was single. He could give one hundred percent of his efforts towards people to God. Amen. But those of us, amen, we're blessed with wife and kids and things like that. It's not that they're not a blessing, but we got to give time to them. Amen. I had a lady tell me one time, uh, you know, uh, I, I would struggle. I would struggle reading my word. I, I would was, I was struggle. You know, me and, my, me and my wife, I tell them at Toyota, I say, I say, me and my wife, we have a busy life outside of here. If I, did, you know, if I didn't have that job at Toyota, I would still have a busy life. You know, that's just added to my busyness. And a lot of times we can get weary. Those of us, I was talking to a lady earlier this week, and, and uh, she was talking about reading her Bible and things like that. A lot of us who, who, uh, who are really desiring, amen, to get closer to God, amen, it irritates us. If it's not irritating you and not bothering you when you go a long time and not reading your, uh, your Bible, your wood's probably wet. You need to come back up to the altar and get some refueling done, amen, because it should bother you if you you don't have a dose of Jesus, amen, every now and then through the written word. It should bother you. There's times, and I'm not saying every time that I read the word that the word's just going to jump off of the pages, but there needs to be times, amen, to where it becomes alive to you. Amen? Sometimes it may not seem like you're getting anything at all out of it. But see, what happens is you're instilling it down in your body. What you, are, you are what you eat, so you're instilling that word inside of you, so you're becoming the word. Amen? We wonder why we, go, why we struggle so much. Maybe we're not the walking word. Amen? Because we haven't fed enough of it inside of us. Maybe that hurt that we're feeling is not the hurt because of the situation, but it's our body's longing for the word of God. We're hungry. My kids, amen. My kids, Josh especially, I wonder sometimes, I hear so many times him talking about his belly hurting. Amen. And I, I've kind of learned as you, as you become a parent, a parent and you're a parent for so long, you just kind of wonder, do they really know what hunger is? You ask them, well, did you eat anything? No. You know, I'm thinking, oh, come on, you know. But I don't think they really understand, you know, sometimes what the feelings are that they have. I think maybe, yeah, maybe, just maybe some of the times that we're struggling and that we're hurting inside, maybe it's because it's our bodies longing out for in some inspired word from God. Amen? Amen? That inspired word. This is our God book. Amen? And if we're not reading it and not instilling it inside our heart, listen, you could read this whole Bible. You could read it from the front cover to the back cover and still not get everything that's in it there's people that's read the whole book from front to back four times maybe even more by now or there's one guy in particular I know but guess what as he continues to read it does that mean he knows everything's in there no he probably don't even remember half and God amen gives us revelation in part so one time through ain't going to do it it is a lifestyle it is a culture you need to set inside yourself of instilling the word of God inside of you Amen. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Which is the Word of God. We got to lear learn to love the Word of God. The Word of God speaks in many different ways. Many different ways. One's a pun. Amen. We've talked about different ways that God speaks before, but I, I've got some, uh, some uh, like fresh revelation on it. One way God can speak is a pun. Seven days without the Lord makes one week. W-E-A-K. That's a pun, amen? That speaks to me. Amen. Seven days without the Lord in my life, I'm going to get weak. I'm not as weak as I am with the Lord. He can speak through a pun, amen? He can speak through your five senses. Anybody remember what the five senses are? I forget if I don't have it wrote down. Sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch. He can speak through all of those things. 
He can speak through a still small voice, which is a voice that comes from for personal instruction or encouragement. Something just real little. I mean, just a still small voice down inside. It comes through our thoughts. There's an internal audible voice. I mean, it's, it's bigger than a small voice of God. It's something internal. It stands out above all our other thoughts. That still small voice, a lot of times, if we're not in tune with God, we don't even recognize that it is God, maybe. And if we do, we, we can question it at times, wondering if it, hey, is this God? Is this me? Or is it just crazy thoughts? Or what? Amen. But the, the, uh, there's an internal audible voice that stands out above all the other thoughts and cuts through those. I mean, God can speak through that way. Also, I believe God can speak through the audible voice of God, which relates to the senses, hearing. Glimpses in the spirit, which are internal pictures. We, uh, we picture something. I've had a guy pray over me one time, and, uh, and you guys may have see, seen it. That, uh, certain people, when they pray over things, God will show them images. Maybe not a certain word over somebody, but he may show, uh, show a certain image, a lighthouse or, or, or a river or something like that. And they got to interpret what God says. It's that inspired word of God. Amen. Internal visions, which are storylines. Open visions, which is something that we see through the Spirit when our eyes are open. Dreams. How many of us have had dreams? I believe God can definitely speak through dreams. Some of them's literal and some of them symbolic. I believe there's also impressions. I've talked about impressions so much, but there's even different levels of impressions. There, one level of impressions are sudden thoughts. I've told you about the time I went to work and I had just this little feeling I should take a different route to work and I didn't. And I went on 35 and I was on my way to work and there was a wreck there. Had to use my last hour of vacation time. See, it cost me something because I didn't listen to God. Amen? It cost me something. See, when we don't listen to God, there's a price to be paid. Amen? It costs us something. It's a feeling that we experience. Uh, just, a, just a slight feeling. Number two, there's impressions in our body, which is, is a sensation, amen, uh, in our body when someone else has an injury or sickness. I know somebody who's a pastor of a church right now, God will show him if somebody's having neck trouble, his neck will start hurting. There's also impressions in our emotions. We'll feel what somebody else is feeling. Have you ever been around somebody and just kind of feel discouraged or feel down or something uh, because that's what they are feeling? See, God can speak to you in every form uh, or, or every way. He has multiple different ways that he can get, get to us. Amen. That inspired word, the word that we need to speak unto people, and sometimes we may not even need to speak it to people. It's for us. He has multiple ways to get our attention. Amen. Our body is divided up in the, in, into the, to the body, the soul, and the spirit. Amen. Amen. The spirit is where, where the Holy Spirit lives. Amen. They say Jesus lives in our heart. Amen. Jesus Jesus went away and said, I'll send a comforter. It's the Holy Spirit that lives in our heart, amen? But then it's got our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions. We just talked about our emotions, amen? Amen, how God can speak to us through our emotions, letting us feel the things that other people feel. And then we got our bodies, amen? God can speak to us through our bodies by letting us feel the way that... See, God is a complete package. You realize that? God will get your attention if he wants to bad enough. He will get your attention. And I believe if there's ever a time of day that where we need to listen more to the Spirit of God, amen, listen more to that inspired word, amen, we need to do it now. Amen, we need to do it now. We need to listen, amen. There's people that's hurting out there. There's people that, listen, a lot of times if I'm not careful, I want to operate like with my kids when they frustrate me. I want to offer, I, I want to I work out a frustration, amen. Yeah, I, I remember a situation that happened here not too long long ago, one of my kids really frustrated me really bad, and I'm thinking in my head, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you need to just calm down and just chill out, don't say anything right now, amen, but you know what, did I listen? No, no, 
Because here's what daddy wants to do. Daddy wants to bust in and I, I want to save the day. Listen, you will do this. You will do that. Hey Amen. This is the way it's going to be. How do you think it turned out when I did that? It didn't turn out so good. So good. Amen. See, we need, to, we need to be in tune with God and we need to recognize the different ways that he speaks, which is that word. See, the word all total, amen, 100% of the word, it's like a sword, amen? It's like a sword. Uh, Hebrews 4.12, if you will turn that real quick. Hebrews 4.12. Let me tell you what the word of God will do. See, all of those things, those little impressions that we feel, amen, uh, the, the, those, those uh, well, whether it's a vision or a dream, it is the word of God. But let me tell you why it's effective, amen. Let me tell you what it'll do. First of all, first of all, it says uh, it's part of the armor. The sword of the Spirit's part of the ar- armor. I'll get to Hebrews here in just a second, but it says back in Ephesians, amen, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, amen. If we want to be strong, and be powerful and be mighty we want to defeat the enemy we got to put on that whole armor and part of that armor is the word of God now this is the word this is the most reliable word because it's written in black and white inspired by God but there's many other different ways that God can show us also Hebrews 4 12 says for the word of God is quick and powerful And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. And the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. (laughs) Listen, I believe the Lord at times gives me a spirit of discernment. Do you think it just... I just have that without ever reading my Bible or without ever listening. See, I got to listen to God to have the discernment. You understand? See, I believe at times God shows me, and it's effective when you're a pastor. You need that as a pastor, that God will show the intents of people's hearts. He is a discerner. Amen. Every Christian in this house, amen, needs the word of God to discern whether something is right or wrong. There's too many Christians out there that hasn't used enough discernment. Amen. The things that should be black and white have become gray. Amen. And, and the, 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 the standards have changed and they become, they become more loose and more acceptive of things that are die cut wrong. I understand. I understand the fact of loving certain people. And, 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 and uh, you know, we should love everybody. And this house is always open to people who want to come and learn from God and stuff. But there are certain people I can't allow up in leadership because I believe it is dead set wrong. Yeah, come to church and learn from God. You need it. But I can't let you up in leadership. I can't let you. God destroyed cities because of the same sin that you're living in. I cannot allow it. And I don't get how some people can. When God destroyed cities. We wonder why the world's getting worse and worse and worse. Eventually the Lord's going to get enough of it. And eventually the world is going to be destroyed. Amen. Because of its sin. Because of its sin. For the word is quick and powerful. Oh, we need something quick. Amen. I mean, you ever had those times it's like, God, see, God never fails me. He's never failed me. I mean, there's been times that I've I've told God, I said, God, I need an answer now. Amen. This thing that I'm going through, I need you to come. I need an answer right now of knowing what to do. You ever had those uh, moments, amen, to where it's like, God, listen, I need something right now. I need you to come through and I need you to intervene. Well, his word is quick. His ways aren't our ways. His time frame ain't on our time frame, but he knows, amen, exactly when you need it. And there's times you definitely need the answer right there, and it's quick. One of the fruits of the Spirit's long suffering, though. So sometimes we may not get it as quick as we. Sometimes it's a want to, it's convenient to want it quick because we don't want to have to worry about it. 
See, God knows what he's doing. He'll give it to you just in perfect timing. He may not give it to you all. At, at the, he may give it to you in part. But I'm so thankful for the grace of my God. He has never failed me. At times when I've, when I've questioned, I've always made it through. Amen? At times I've wondered, God, what are you doing? At times I've wondered, God, I need help. He's always came through. Amen? And continuously to grow and to bless and to flourish. It's quick and it's powerful. No devil can withstand the power of the word of God. Amen. In the book of, uh, uh, in the book, uh, when, when uh, the, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, what was Jesus' defense, amen, against the devil? See, the devil brought up some convincing arguments. And yeah, he had power over the rocks to turn them into bread. He could have. Amen. A thousand legions of angels could have come down and picked him up and kept him if he jumped off of the cliff. First of all, what was the reasoning behind it? Why would you even want to do that? Well, for one, jump off of the cliff. He wasn't a God to have to show off his power all the time and be bragging about it. But his defense was the word of God. It was the word of God. It's powerful. No devil can withstand it. See, some of us may rather complain about the fight that we're in instead of research of how to defeat it. What would we do if our armies and our military and our navy and, and, and the army and the, the National Guard and the Marines and the Navy and all that, if they went to the battle lines, <laughs> they'd be like, <laughs> I don't like how many weapons they got up there. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like the look of that gun. I, 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 don't, I don't like it. I don't want to be here. I'm just going to stand right here. Ain't nobody going to make me lift my hands. Ain't nobody going to make me use that gun. Ain't nobody going to make me fight. I'm just going to stand here. Where, where would our army be? Where would our army be? It'd be dead, maybe. I watched a movie here not too long ago. It, 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 you, you may have seen it. It's called Hacksaw Ridge. And it was about a guy who didn't want to use a weapon. And he went into battle. He, he, never, he, he, he didn't shoot a gun the whole time he was, the whole time he was in the army. And what's, one of the things that stood out about... Uh, you know, to me about that movie, they, when they, when this unit come to relieve people, uh, the, this Hacksaw Ridge, there was a big old cliff, and up on top, they were fighting, they, they had to climb this net rope to get to the top, this thing was big, and they had to climb the rope and get to the top, and when they got to the top, I mean, they, they fought up there. And down here, they, was, they had their um, tents and all that kind of stuff. And they knew what they were going into. That's what stood out to me. They knew what they were going into. Amen. People were getting hurt and people were dying left and right. That's why they were calling in reinforcements. That's why they was even there. It's because they couldn't win the battle. They were hiding, the, I think they were fighting the Chinese people maybe, and they were hiding in bunkers and things like that, and they were whooping them. They were whooping them. Everybody say whooping them. But you know what they did? You know what they did? They climbed up and went in anyway, knowing, knowing that they might not make it back out. That they might, uh, 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 knowing what was some of the previous people, knowing how rough it, uh, it was. I mean, knowing that there had been injured coming. Why is that? Why can a person in the army and the military do that? Go to the front lines and fight knowing that they may not come home. Because they are trained. Because they are trained. We hear about boot camp. Amen. How hard and rough it is about people. Uh, yes, drill sergeant. You know, drop down. Give me 55 push-ups for talking out of line. All that kind of stuff. And how they're hard on them. And things like that. But see, it gets them ready for battle. When it comes time for battle, those people that's got to go to the front lines, they don't question it. They just do it. They know the reason why they're there. And they just march into battle and do it. Now see, God don't yell at us all the time. He don't get in our face and make us do push-ups and sit-ups. But see, God gives us this freedom of choice. And he urges us. He wants us. He wants us to keep going forward and forward. Keep digging out deeper and learning in the word. And keep going further and stronger. He wants us to do that stuff. So that we'll be ready for the battle. 
And when the battle comes, instead of complaining, listen, I want to get complaining sometimes. I do. I'll be honest. You can ask my wife. I do. I don't like being in a situation that's not comfortable. I don't like it. I'm like you guys a lot. I don't, I don't like to be out of my comfort zone. You can ask Charity about that. She'll throw a song in worship or something that I'm not comfortable with. And it immediately wants frustration and aggravation. She'll, she'll, uh, uh, it, it's been a challenge for me to have her to be worship leader. Because I'm used to accepting that role. And I can, I can pick the songs. You know? Well, so now she picks the songs. And I look at that song list sometimes and I'm thinking, oh, man. But, but instead of complaining, we need to be ready. We need to be ready. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, it's not saying, it's saying that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Perry Stone, I mean, he's, he thinks it's like this. One edge is for when God speaks. The second edge is when we speak it out. Sharper than any two-edged sword. We need the word. We need the word. It's powerful. It's quick. It, de- it discerns things. So here we are this morning. I believe that we can have different levels of the word. Some of us, some of us, we read our Bibles every day. Some of us, we pray and seek God for, for him to speak to us. And listen... It may not necessarily mean that they're super Christians or unsuper Christians. It may just mean some of us are further along. Amen. Some of us uh, sometimes, I mean, the, I believe the further along that we go, the more lover of the word that we'll get, the more that we read it. Amen. So, first of all, a lot of us are like this. Who can tell me what this is? It's a pocket knife, right? Pocket knife. I better watch out or I'll cut myself. It's a pocket knife. See, a lot of us are, we've got the word of God to us is like a pocket knife. What is a pocket knife? It's something we carry in our front pocket. We may bring it to church. We may not. Listen, you may be surprised about how many Bibles I see left on the seats here in the sanctuary. You may be surprised. Yeah, well, most of us, we have more than one uh, Bible and, and uh, things like that. And we may read it at the house. But if we don't, you know, it makes you kind of wonder sometimes, well, are we... Are we reading our Bible at the house? Because I see them all over the place (laughs) sitting here at church, you know? And I don't know about you guys, but I've got certain Bibles that I like. Uh, Certain Bibles, I'll switch off. I've got so many Bibles around the the house, thanks thanks to the good Lord. I'll switch off and things. And if I leave my Bible here, it's by accident, unless it's like Sunday morning to Sunday night and things like that. But... Uh, a lot of us, we, we, carry, we carry the word in our front pocket, but it's hardly ever used. How many times do we use a pocket knife? Some of you farmers and things may use it more than others. If I carry a pocket knife, I don't use it very much. It's just there. It's just there. You know, some people, they carry their word to the church, and it's just there, except for when we're bored. What happens when you got a pocket knife? A little kid's got a pocket knife, and he's bored. What happens? <laughs> Funny story. I remember... Remember years ago, Blake, we was living at, at, in our trailer in Galpless Ferry, and he had a pocket knife, and I was trying to give him some responsibility. Uh, you know, I was trying to let him grow up a little bit, and he had a pocket knife, and I, I, I handed him mine, maybe, and I, I told him, go out, I said, I said we had something. I can't, something that came in, I, I had him cut the boxes open. I was like, go on out there and cut the boxes open. I'll be out there a little bit. Now, Charity, you know, she's being a mom, and I probably should have listened to her this time. <clears throat> but uh, she was like, she's like, don't do that. I was like, oh, he'll be okay. He's just cutting boxes open. I go out there, and sure enough, he had already cut his hand but because, uh, you know, he wasn't using it right. Amen. He hadn't had maybe enough instruction. See, you give somebody the word when they're bored a lot of times that hardly ever reads it and don't read and learn from it. Guess what? Sometimes trouble can come because you got to rightly divide the whole word. You can't always take just one scripture and just go with it. You got to rightly divide the whole word. You got to understand the customs that's going on in a certain area. You got to un- you need to understand the reasoning why it was said when it was said. If that's the case, my wife and Kay and Brittany can never get up and preach because it tells women to be quiet in the church. I kind of wish it said that in the house sometimes.
a pocket knife when it's bored. Some of us have a lot of them, but how many times do we actually use it? We spend time whittling away. What's a kid do when he has a pocket knife and he's bored? He starts whittling away at a stick. Amen, because he's bored. And see us a lot of times with, with our Bibles, we're the same way because we'll just start whittling away. We'll, we'll put emphasis on things that's insignificant. Whittling around on that little stick, that's really insignificant. That's not, that's just killing boredom is what it is. Amen? There's nothing spiritually significant that comes sometimes out of just reading the Bible just once a month or something like that, reading a scripture too, just to say you can read it, or just because you're bored and you ain't got nothing else to do. Amen? See, that's the way a lot of Christians are. They'll go to work and they want to act like they know what they're talking about, but still yet, when's the last time they opened the book? They just opened it because they got bored or nobody else was in the house or there wasn't a movie on that they want to watch. There wasn't a card game to play with their kids. Or the kids wasn't home to go out and shoot basketball with or the pool hadn't been shocked that day to get in uh, to the pool. Amen? Listen, I deal with it too. I like to get out in the pool and things like that. But see, all that stuff steals our time. All that stuff steals our time. Too many of us. The word of God is like a pocket knife to us. It's like a pocket knife. To some of us, the word of God is like a butter knife. Now, this is like the best one that I could find, but hey amen. Some of the fancier china sets and things, they have nice butter knives, and they only come out at special, occasion, at special occasions. They're fancy. They look nice, and, they, and, and, and they're, they're put out for special occasions for special purposes. The Word of God is like a fancy butter knife sometimes to a lot of us. It inspires, it, it blesses, but it never offends. A butter knife don't fend. I can sit there and rub it across my finger. It, it don't hurt me. Really, I mean, unless maybe I really got into it. You know, I'm not going to try that. <laughs> be bleeding up here. But See, the Word of God is like that to a lot of us. Amen. See, the Word of God, it not only, I mean, it's supposed to push us to better things. We don't like to be pushed. I'll tell you right now, I don't like to be pushed. I don't like to be pushed. I don't like somebody pushing at me. I don't like for my kids to pressure me. Josh, he's one of the worst. He wants to go fishing. You may hear 10 times a day, hey, you know what would be great? To go fishing today. I don't like to be pushed. That's offensive to me. But see, the word of God is supposed to urge us to do something. And it's like a butter knife to some of us. We don't want to read the part that pushes us to better standards, to live in a better way, to doing better things. Amen. We just want to read the good stuff. Bless, uh, I bless the Lord with all my heart. If I reap, I sow. If I pay my tithes, God's going to give it to me a hundredfold. It don't say just a hundredfold. It says what? Some 60, some 90, and some, some 30, and some 100. So this time you give your tithes. Somebody may give you a pack of gum. But see, we want to read the good stuff. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I like that part. I like that part. But the part that pushes me past my comfort zone, further than I want to go... I don't like that. See, too many times the word of God is like a butter knife to a lot of us. To some of us, the word of God is like a meat cleaver. That's the best I could do for a meat cleaver. Amen. It's like a meat cleaver. What a meat cleaver does, it cuts the meat to the bone. It gets the meat off from everything. When I smoke food, I like to get a good sharp knife if I'm going to cut some fat off. I don't like to have a butter knife or something sitting there cutting a fat off of it or what. I want something that's going to cut. I want something that's going to do something. Amen. See, the word of God to some people, it's like that. It does something for them. It stirs up inside of their soul. Amen. It cuts the meat down to the bone. It discerns what's right and what's not. And get this. What does a meat cleaver do? It can cut just... You ever seen them commercials of them one knives, amen, that can cut through a can, but still yet cut a tomato just as good as it did the first time, and they're sitting there chopping through a can? 
See, the Word of God, it needs to be like that, amen? That's the way it needs to be. It needs to cut through anything. If, Amen? If somebody comes up here and gives us some milk and not very much Word, amen, they give us just a little bit, we should be able to find some meat in everything. See, not everybody is called to be a preacher. And those people who get up to teach and things, amen, even Christian people at work, when they say something, we should be able to see the good and feed from them in everything. Draw something away from what God is saying. We're not all going to, not every sermon that we hear, not everything that we hear is going to be some big divine a revelation from God of, of, of the prophetic that's going to speak something that's going to happen four years from now. Amen. Not every, every one of them is going to be a Joel Osteen message. Amen. Talking about blessings and favor. I just said that, didn't I? <laughs> Listen, I like that message. I like it. And that, there's a time and there's a place for that. Amen. But when, when I'm listening to Stephen Furtick on my cell phone and I'm getting some meat out of that or whether I'm sitting in Brittany's Sunday school class or Lola's Sunday school class and they're talking to little kids and maybe not using as big a words and they're bringing, I need to be able to draw something from that. See, that's what the Word of God needs to be. We draw something good. Amen. Not only that, but the Word of God will allow us to see the good and the good purpose that everybody has. See, everybody has a good purpose of what God wants them to be and we should be able to see that. It cuts up the intents of the hearts and the motive. Motive. See, if, we're, if we got the word of God like a meat cleaver, then we can cut through the masks that a lot of us put on and get down to the root of the cause, get down to what their real motives are or whether they're truly dedicated or not to what they're doing. So that's the way it needs to be. Now, Blake, come on up here, buddy. Now, some of us, thank you, sir. I love this thing. Some of us, J Jimmy Lovejoy at this morning. I was in a youth service one time, and Jimmy Lovejoy over a bunch of youth went like that right over the top of their head. People was like, ooh, ooh. See, the word of God, even more than the meat cleaver, it needs to be like the... A two-edged sword. Amen? What's a two-edged sword does? It cuts on both sides. It cuts going in. It may even cut coming back out. It not only, amen, it not only, it, it not only helps you when you're bored. Amen? It's not only there for when you got good things to say. See, that butter knife, amen, it only works through hot butter, warm butter, amen. That's uh, the best time that it works, amen, amen through warm butter. You, you bring some opposition against it, it don't want to work very well. But the sword of the Spirit, a two-edged sword, amen, when it's sharpened down and it's bladed up real good, it works no matter the instance, no matter the circumstance, no matter what comes my way. Amen, some devil comes against me, I'm going to cut it going in, I'm going to cut it going back out, and I'm liable to be like David it and chop its head off. See, a two-edged sword, amen, it, it cuts. It cuts, uh, it discerns of the motives and the intents. It gets made out of everything, but it's also made for the big stuff, the big battles, amen. You're equipped for the big battles, amen. When the devil comes against me and he fights me like a roaring lion and I don't know which way to turn, he equips me for the big stuff. The sword of the Spirit. He equips me for the big stuff. Spiritual battles. See, some of us, we don't have enough word into us that we can even fight the spiritual battles. But still yet, we want to. We want to step up against the devil and say, For I, uh, the Lord giving me power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy. Yeah, he's gave it to you, but you've got to eat it. You've got to feed it inside yourself and prepare and practice and be ready. He makes it available, but it's up to you whether you pick it up and fight with it. See, some of us, listen, this sword's been up in that case above that door ever since I've been here. <laughs> Boy, 
might do something different with that. I like it. Maranatha Cornerstone Church. It's time we pick up the sword. Right. Right. Amen. It's time we pick up the sword. <laughs> oh, it's time we pick up the sword. Battles are going to come. Battles we're going to face. But we got to pick up the sword and fight and fight and fight. Let's all stand. I just leave that right there. Thank you, though. I might use it. Somebody's coming to the altar today. time when we pick up the sword and use it. Amen. I talked to a lady this week. Such a hunger for God. Such a hunger for God. She has more hunger in her for God and to do His work than a lot of us ever even have thought of even having. She she, wanted, she wants to do good. She feels that if she does good and reads her Bible and draws closer to God, that it will help her husband. And she, she, was, she was afraid that she had the wrong motives. Let me tell you how I started out reading my Bible. I, had the, I didn't have the right motives. Listen, I hope that I've encouraged you this morning to let you know the importance of the word. Amen. The importance of the Bible. Amen. The inspired word of God. Amen. Uh, not just the Bible, but even hearing from God. I've been trying to. I've been trying to get it through to you now for the past two, three, for like three or four weeks that I've preached on this. That it is very important. Amen. The uh, prayer is important and that stuff, but the, the word is very important. But when I first started reading my word, listen, I was a preacher's kid. I grew up a preacher's kid. I cut my teeth maybe on the church pew. Been in church all my life. It would seem weird maybe uh, for a little bit to, uh, uh, if I got out of church. I mean, that's what I know. That's what I do. But still yet, amen, as I grew up and as I growed uh, uh, and stuff, I still pulled away. I never really read my Bible real consistent for a long period of time, the whole time growing up. I come to the altar, I come to the altar, I come to the altar. I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. Even faked things. I, maybe I wanted the attention, maybe. Sometimes it was legit that I wanted to come and pray. I remember back being younger. <laughs> I can it was after we moved up here, and we moved up here when I was in sixth grade. And I remember, I, I mean, I, I remember when my life kind of started to change, and the devil wanted to root something inside of me, amen, that I still struggle with today, amen, a mind battle, amen, that because, and you know, I got such a, such a stronghold, amen, is because there wasn't enough word there. I didn't talk to nobody about it because, amen, I thought I was doing the right thing and I didn't talk to nobody about it, amen, and I didn't let nobody know that I was going through something and I kept doing the same thing and it got rooted in my soul because somebody didn't say, hey, right back then, the word of God, amen, that's not the way it's supposed to be. God is not the author of confusion. He didn't, I didn't, I, I wasn't told that because I didn't let anybody know that I was going through anything. And it got rooted inside of me. And I remember about the time me and Charity, it was not long before we got married. My motives, my motives weren't good. I started reading my Bible. You know, I, I decided I wanted to make a change, but I made it out of condemnation. I started reading my Bible and I felt horrible if I missed. I felt horrible. Felt horrible. Felt like I sinned. Listen, I'm not going to say that you sin if you don't, if you ain't, if you miss a day reading your Bible. See, it shouldn't be a thing that where you read your Bible and you read it because you have to. It should be, amen, we should be a lover of the word. We read it because we want to. But see, 
this person that I was talking to this week, their motives were wrong. Their motives was wrong. They was wanting to read their Bible and get closer to God so it would help their husband. And yeah, I mean, they wanted to do good too, but part of it, they, they wanted to help their husband. But let me tell you something about the motives, what happened. Sometimes the wrong motives gets us kicked in gear. Amen. I used to go to church, and I become so I become to enjoy church as much as I do for the wrong motives. You know why? Because a cell phone couldn't reach me that well at church, and work couldn't call me. So guess what? I wanted to go to church because work was stressed me out, and I wanted to go to church, and I wanted to get away from everything, and I didn't care if I stayed all night because the longer I stayed the less I knew about work and the less stressed I was out I would get this feeling before I went home this 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 uh, this uh, like I don't know. It's just it's weird feeling. It's dread. It was a dread that come over me to hear the answering machine at the house. This was a country church, so the only time you could get cell phone signal was standing up on a tree stump and sticking your phone out like that. And I wasn't going to do that. I wasn't going to go out of my way unless I had to. Motives were wrong. The motives were wrong. Everybody say motives. But let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. As I read my Bible, and my motives were wrong. I felt condemned if I didn't read it. So I kept reading it because I didn't, I didn't want to sin. I didn't want to sin. I felt like I was sinning. But what happened is, the closer that I got with God, the more that I hung out in church and did the church thing. Yeah, it was out of the wrong motives, but the closer to God I got, and the more he changed my motives. So now, 8, 10, 12 years later, guess what? He's called me to sit up in the pastor's seat. And yeah, it started out. You know, started out. See, I, I marked that time. I marked that time right before me and Charity got married as a turning point in my life. I don't even know if I was praying every day at the moment. I started out, I think, with reading my Bible. I may have been praying too. It started out with the wrong motives. But that, amen, that's the wrong motives. See, God worked the wrong motives out of me. The closer you get, your motives change. Amen? The closer you get to God. See, he'll start working and he'll define it on you. See, see, God... Is the owner of the sword. He speaks the two-edged sword, the, the sword of the Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit is the power of this a sword of, of, well, of the sword of the Spirit. So little by little, as I drew closer and closer, guess what? God took in me and he stuck maybe a little bit right there. And he started trimming off some bad motives. He started trimming off some junk, amen, that didn't need to be. Maybe some pride, amen. Maybe some anger issues that I had. And he starts forming me into this new creation. Amen. See, I started out a blob. Amen. That's what I started out. But amen, as God cut away the junk that didn't need to be there, I become into the person. Amen. More and more. He's still cutting away. He's the owner of the sword and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's the power behind it. There is nothing that can stop it. There is nothing that it cannot cut through if we just let it. We need to get to the place where we're picking up the sword of the Spirit. This morning, I want to ask, I know I'm going a little long, but is it good? Amen. Could we all come up this morning and pray that God helps us to grab a hold of the sword of the Spirit, turn our pocket knife in for a sword? Because, listen, as Christians, we're going to have to stand on the front line. At, at, at times, maybe or we're going to have to fight in a battle. And listen, if I'm coming to fight an enemy, if I was in the army and I come to fight an enemy, I'd much rather have this than this little pocket knife. Yeah. Amen. Some of them little pocket knives are cheap and they break easy. See, a lot of us Christians, sometimes we break easy. Oh, but... I need something sturdy. I need something reliable. I need something, amen, that's not dull like the butter knife. I need something that I know when I swing, that every swing, when I make contact, it's going to do something. Yes. Let's all come this morning as, as uh, 
uh, Kelly to put some music on. Can we all come to the altar and ask God to let us pick up the sword? Pick up the sword this morning. So we can be more effective in the kingdom. More effective in the kingdom, not just for ourselves, but for our families, for our church, for everybody.